Welcome back to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast, where you'll find information on what's going on on the North Fork of Long Island. We'll be focusing on issues and opportunities going on in the community, as well as people and stories from the present and the past. I'm your host, Christopher Bianchi, and for episode 48, our guest today is Hector de Cordova, and we talk to him about his ancestry as well as his childhood growing up in the Washington Heights area of Manhattan. He shares how he developed an interest in the arts early on in his life and attended Fiorello H. LaGuardia High School of Music and Art. And Hector also reflects on living on his own early on in New York City. And our conversation also covers his time in the Navy as well as coming out of the Navy and going to Parsons for interior design. And eventually we discuss his journey to the East End, starting on the South Fork and later moving to the North Fork where he opened his gallery in Greenport. So I hope you enjoy episode 48 with Hector de Cordova. This episode was recorded April 19th, 2024. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. So to start off, could you give me a little introduction where you were born and raised? Okay, that's very simple. I was born in New York, in Manhattan, an area called Washington Heights. And... uh it yeah. it was a good childhood. It was a good place to to live. I don't know about these days because I haven't been back there in years. But when was the last time you went back? You know, it's hard to remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, the last time I I passed through and I saw by miraculously a childhood friend coming out of the subway and we talked for a little bit and but I don't remember why I was there (laughs) I had a reason but oh yes one of the people in the building that I was brought up in called me and asked me if I would help her with something and I said sure so I was on my way there Mm -hmm. I have no idea what it's like today yeah I'm almost afraid to go and see. I know. And then, so go, going back further uh, for your ancestry, could you, how far back can you go on your, or both of your parents? Both and, my parents. Or how far back can I go? Yes. Really, having been born in Manhattan and raised there, they would come and visit from Puerto Rico. We were like a spot and they would come sometimes they would stay with us sometimes they would stay in a hotel but I pretty much knew all my relatives because they had come and spent time with us in New York and then eventually I did did go to Puerto Rico Mm. but I only spoke Spanish it was my first language my folks insisted on it and I'm very lucky that they did, because yes. it's was very handy today. <laughs> yes, because uh, I feel like with some families that that do move over here, they they might have said don't speak or speak English. You know, almost. some did, some, some did, but not mine. Mm-hmm. And so your your parents were born in Puerto Rico. They were born in Puerto Rico. My father was born in Ponce, and my mother was born in Comerio. And I eventually visited both places, and I thought, well, okay. But <laughs> it, it was it was interesting, kind of. Yeah, it was an interesting visit. Uh, I went to see where certain favorite relatives lived 
mm-hmm. or visit them briefly, and it was very pleasant, but it wasn't home. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. And did you get to meet any of your grandparents? Uh, they were gone. Okay. Yeah. So I, I met uh, sisters and brothers. My, my mother's father had 28 children. Wow. That's what I always say. <laughs> and a lot of different women. <laughs> oh. But there were different days then. And, and uh, this was in the early 20s, mm-hmm. 1920s. So it was another world. And did your parents say why they came over? No. No? no. I'm, as I get older, I put two and two together and figure things out. And it's, it's nice. It's not nice. It's good. It's not good. It's a mixed bag. It's like for everybody else, I think. They've got their own stories. Mm-hmm. And w- where did they settle? It, well, did your parents meet in Puerto Rico, or did they meet over? No, actually, uh, they met in New York. My mother's sister, my aunt, had a business where she would rent these huge apartments in very nice neighborhoods, and then she would rent rooms. And this was another world, and I laugh at it because recently I really I realized that she started the first first bed and breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> now and then, where did your parents settle? What, in Manhattan. Where in Manhattan? Uh, well, 174th Street in Washington Heights. 151st in Washington Heights, uh, pretty much all over. Hmm. And what did they do for a, a living? Like your well, father? Okay, my father worked in New Jersey. And he went to, to Newark, New Jersey every day, early, early in the morning. And he came back in the evening. Uh, he worked for a firm called Vernon Royal Line. Uh, I, th- I believe they were bookbinders uh, for books and regular books and manufacturers of blank book, you know, pages, blank books where people use to go to school with, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mother, well, she was bringing me up while I was growing up there and, and uh, she she actually she was a seamstress uh that's pretty much and then she went from be, being a mommy to uh working at uh oh god it, it was on it was on 38th street and and uh it was my both my parents First job they ever got, that's a job they finished with. They did that through their whole career? Yeah. Whole life? Yeah. Um, and how many siblings? I was an only you child. You were an only child? I was an only child. Wow. I, when I first went to school in New York, I didn't speak English. And it was a traumatic experience. Uh, kids are not kind. Mm. But then, I'm not sure which is my language, you know, mm. now, today. Yeah. Oh, and then just before we get to the, your with school and you growing up there, do you have any stories that your parents kind of passed down to you that you remember? S- some of them are comical. My mother's sister, half-sister, was, she refused to speak English. And she was, like, really strong. I don't know why, but 
she did. And eventually there came an occasion where there was an emergency and she had to speak English and she finally did. But she was a funny woman. She, uh, she my, my mom and, and uh, friends and relatives and lots of cousins, oh my God, lots of cousins, would go to a movie. The, the movie was called The Del Mar. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they, they would come back, and the movie, of course, was in English, and they would come back, and they would sit down, and then they would have their cousin, a sister, whatever, how they were, they would sit her down, and she's the one that didn't speak English, would not, and they would say, okay, tell us your version of the movie, because she would go. And uh, then they would all sit down and enjoy another movie, because she would change the script and everything. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they enjoyed themselves. It was a good life, uh -huh. in short, you know. Yes. Very funny things, but that was one of them, and that, that was what. Uh, when was that? That was in the thirties. Wow! And that was uh, middle late thirties. Wow! And then, so you were born upper Upper West Upper Upper East, West Side Upper West Side, yeah, on a hundred and sixty eighth Street. Presbyterian Hospital. <laughs> Not that I remember, of course. <laughs> and then for, for you mentioned a little bit with, you grew up only speaking Spanish I, in right. your house. I mean, eventually, the English was spoken at home. But initially, it was both important to both my parents uh, that I speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. So, in the, in the home, that was the language. And then later on, and they both spoke English, but yes. it, it, uh, they, they just wanted that other language in, in the home. Yes, definitely. And then for yourself growing up in the, that neighborhood, could you kind of describe a little bit what it was like? It was fun. I had a good, good childhood. It was very safe. Uh, there was a lot for a kid to do, and I mean, it was a, was it more an urban environment? Would you say, or it's yes, kind of yes? Because was it more um, four or five story building? Oh yes, yes. And five stories was was it actually? because I don't remember any of the buildings being more than that. Mm -hmm. And some of them were five-story walk-ups, so. Wow, <laughs> yeah. And what was, the, could you describe a little bit of the demographics of the neighborhood? Was, or were there, was it mostly Puerto Ricans? No, it was, it was, it was mainly a Jewish neighborhood. I grew up being very much at home with Jewish families because of the neighborhood and who was living there. Most of the kids that I played with were pretty much on the Jewish side of it. Uh, mm -hmm. There were some Hispanic people, but it developed, it grew. It kept later. Changing, yes. Yeah. Yes. As uh, I grew, the neighborhood grew. <laughs> yes. And kind of what do you have any kind of vivid memories of any events or things that you might do on the street for fun? Yeah, we played stickball. I was very much in junior high school. The teach I, I never thought of being an artist as a profession. I just liked to paint, mm -hmm. like most kids do. And... As time went by, certain teachers noticed 
my work, and they kind of took me under their wing. At first, since really I, I couldn't decide what I wanted to do with the rest of my life, I, I used to sing, and I had a hell of a voice. And they would, there was a Mrs. Specter and an, a Mrs. Amar, Meringoff, I think, and and uh, they were very kind to me, very good. And they, I remember Mrs. Specter. Oh, Mrs. Meringoff was uh, somehow mixed up with the Riverside church and she would take me there and hide me in the balcony and I would perform. They wouldn't see me. All they heard was this soprano voice coming out of the, <laughs> out of the ether, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it was fun. It was fun. But eventually uh they took me to, when it came to choosing a high school, they chose it for me. And it was music and art high school, which was, in, of course, in this city. And uh, it, it, I started really in the, in the music program, and I would be singing, and then a very strange and natural thing happened. My voice changed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't sing anymore, not for a while. So... You didn't I, have that... Well, because were you, you were doing that more in middle school? Where yeah, you were singing? As, as, as middle school, I, I was doing it both early on and then later on in middle school. And they took me by the scruff of my neck and pulled me in and uh, did an audition. I got accepted into the music program and that's when my voice changed. <laughs> and then I really, I fell in love with the school and I was heartbroken because I had to leave. And then I said, how about if I stay in, in, stay in the art program? And they said, okay. Uh, can you show us a portfolio? And I said, what's a portfolio? <laughs> <laughs> so they explained what it was, and I said, do I have time to make one? And they mm -hmm. said, sure. And I did. Yeah. And they looked at it, and they were happy with it, and they said, okay, you're in, in the program. And that was it. I took off from there, and it, it's a, it was a great school. It still is a great school, as I understand it. Is that is it is that the same school that's the LaGuardia? Is yes. it the LaGuardia? Yes. Music and art school. Yeah. Were there any other memories from elementary or middle school? Yeah, my first day of school, it was unforgettable. I didn't speak a word of English. I got into school, and I remember kids in I think it was five or six years old. And it's like I went in and the kid says, okay, come on in, you know. Yeah. And eventually I fit in, but uh, it was difficult. The first the first, first uh, few days, it's amazing how when you're very, very young, how quickly you learn. Mm -hmm. And I was also interesting, would your, your parents would be okay with you going about like even in elementary, middle school, playing outside and... Yes, there was no problem. There was a great park at the end of 174th Street, and that was one of the places that we would go to. Little by little, I grew into different things that were going on in the neighborhood. Uh, 181st Street was uh, very popular. That's where all the movie houses were. And, and then so... For high school, uh, I went first to the to Humboldt Junior High. Humboldt, Humboldt, which is uh, very near to where I lived, and from there, that's where the teachers took great notice of me and 
started me at in high, when I mo- graduated from there. I went to music and art, and was that free? For yes, us? yes, that was, it free. was all free. Wow, it was it was a, it was a great time. Mm-hmm. It really was. And so they and you mentioned that you switched to more fine arts. Yes. From the, uh, the music. When my voice changed, I could no longer be in the music department. I did not want to leave music and art high school. And the teachers took pity on me. And that's when the whole thing with, do you have a portfolio you can show us? That's when it took place. And so I put a portfolio together. Did they give you a list of things they wanted you to have, either painting or... Yeah, yeah, a list of things that I should paint. And But you hadn't painted at this time. Yes, I had. A little bit? A little bit. Uh, not, you know, the way everybody else did. Mm-hmm. But I stood out. Mm-hmm. And also, while you were at the music and art school, would you explore other parts of Manhattan and go by um, Midtown and go down to like... It was pretty much when weekends came around and family gatherings would happen. We had friends in Staten Island. We had friends in different parts of the city and we would get together there. We would, if once someone in the family had a car, and a few of us did. We would take trips up to. Uh, it it was it was a like a state park, and and uh, more uh, going upstate New York. Going upstate New York, uh-huh. and we would travel up there and picnic there, and you know it it was good. Uh-huh. It was very good. Staten Island was very much country. Very country at that time. At that time. <laughs> and we would go there. We had friends at Fort Wadsworth, uh, the military uh, base there. And that was very nice. Mm. We would go there. And that was country for us. Yeah. And then also, would you have kind of the typical holidays that you celebrated at that time? Typical holidays. We were, every weekend we would sh- have rice and beans. <laughs> every week was it every s- Sunday? It was, or? No, it was almost lots of days of the week. We had a very ethnic uh, way of eating, and and uh, mm-hmm. I still do it today. So I learned to cook from from my parents, okay. from my parents' friends. <laughs> I learned to cook so well that I opened up a restaurant and a bar on the Hamptons, <laughs> 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 which was okay for a while. It wasn't known for its cuisine, but it was a good place. And it yeah. it was part owner of a hotel called Hilltop Acres in Sag Harbor. And I was partners with a dentist at the time, and he was overwhelmed by it. Mm-hmm. And I said, I'll help you out, when, but what did I know? And anyway, but I did manage to help him out and it went on from there. But also after, after you've graduated from the music and art school, what were you kind of thinking of doing? Oh, after music and art. Uh, for a while, I just took jobs. I was I had a job in the flower market, doing making trees, <laughs> <laughs> and they were Ming trees, Oriental trees, and I would. I, I it's hard to remember. We're talking about many years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would. I was pretty good at it, and. It, it this magazine from florist magazine came in they did an interview of me by surprise and 
Later on, they called again and they said they wanted to send a photographer down because it was interesting looking. We had ordered wood, Manzanita wood, from California and and uh, and sagebrush, and we made the trees out of that. And they, they were quite quite something. And mm-hmm. I've, I, I, once in a blue moon, not anymore, but we're talking about many, many years ago now, but I would find one or two trees that I had made or somebody else that was working down there with me had made. And they came down, they took photographs, they came out, I was thrilled, you know, I, I, I came out on a magazine as Mr. Ming. <laughs> 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 and I would be making the trees, and it was a good yeah. life. And at this time, were you still working on artwork? In a way, that was artwork. Yes. But uh, within that, yeah. But I was still painting. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I. I don't. I'm not quite sure. Actually, I was. I. I even have. This, the High School of Music and Art was really a very sophisticated program. So a lot of the work that you do there is not bad. And mm-hmm. I, I still have today, and this is a long time ago that I did this, I have a woodcut that I did of an abandoned gold mine in Nova Scotia. Mm-hmm. And it was quite an adventure. Uh, one of my buddies from school, I can't believe I remember his name, John Gleason. He was a musician, he was in the music, he was quite a violinist. Uh, of course, he graduated from medical school <laughs> later <laughs> on. <laughs> but you know, life has its twists and turns, mm-hmm. and you never know what's going to be around the corner. And if you're a certain age, you just do it and go with it, mm-hmm. and so. And could you give a little time frame about when you had graduated from there, and then you were working? Oh well, I was of a certain age. The draft was on my back, and what uh, what year was Korean Korean War? The Korean War, and uh, I said okay, so I enlisted in the Navy because I, I wanted to make a choice. I didn't want to just go into the Army. And, and I had had an experience that it's too long to go into, but where it wasn't a bad experience, but I knew I didn't want anything to do with the Army. Mm-hmm. So I first I applied for the Air Force, and that they weren't taking anybody, and then I applied for the Navy, and they were taking. So I got into that, and made a very good choice. Uh, They worked, while I was there, you take all these aptitude tests and things, and of all things, they put me working with atomic medicine. (laughs) 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 Because because of my experience as an artist. (laughs) But... They don't really, did, when you initially were brought, went to the, did you have to go to Annapolis? No, not did, Annapolis. I wasn't an officer, I was an enlisted man. But where were you I was in, based? Uh, uh, I was stationed, well, I, I was stationed at first in, uh, oh God, I'll tell you where, I, I ended up in Bethesda National. Oh, okay. Okay. And while I was there, I went into different programs because they, you have two years that are on land and two years that are at sea. Well, this was on my on land period and they put me into working with atomic medicine. Uh, I remember I-131 doing uh, blood volume tests and, and, and I was a corpsman. First, I became a corpsman. Mm-hmm. I went to school in the Navy for that. And then I went into school for working with uh, that th- isotopes, radioactive oh. isotopes. And it was good. Uh, I enjoyed it. 
How long were you in the I was Navy? in that for two years, and then I had two years left to go on the four years stint in the Navy, and I went to sea as a corpsman, and it was really good. I, I enjoyed my stay in the Navy. I came very close to staying in it and retiring from it. After four years, I had to make that decision, and I'm glad I made the decision I made, but it would have been very nice, too, to have made the other one. I had good luck in that way. Mm-hmm. You know, they opened up a lot of doors for me, mm-hmm. which was good. Yes. And could you talk about a, a little bit what other things you kind of did? did after that because you had come back from the Navy. I'd come back from the Navy. But you were back in Manhattan. I had the GI Bill and uh, I wanted to go a little further but I I didn't know which way to turn and I decided to apply to an art school. Um, I'm having a little trouble with my memory right now but it, it was a very good school. It was on 56th Street in the east side. And uh, I went into the program. I applied for it. I was accepted. I had the GI Bill to pay for it and went from there. And also part-time jobs. And it was, was that the, that was not Parsons. 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 Parsons School of Design. So you applied there after the Navy with the the GI Bill? After. I applied and paid for it with the GI Bill. And I worked for, I worked for the sculptor while I was there, uh, Robert Burks, who just passed, he passed passed recently. Not recently, but a few years ago. Years ago, not that long ago. No. How did you, you met him at Parsons? Uh, No. I, I met him through the school when I, I said I needed help and I needed part-time jobs. And they said, okay. And they introduced me to him. And we talked for a while and he said, okay. And I think he was on 92nd Street in Manhattan at the time. So it was good. Mm-hmm. But what, what did, did I do for him? Cool. I worked for him. Uh, part time in the evenings, and uh, he had a, a, a wonderful studio there. Was working on the Brandeis monument, mm. and I helped him out with that. And uh, mainly, it was like you know work that had to be done. Mm-hmm. And I do remember that he taught me how to make molds. And uh, I poured a lot of Brandeis busts for him that were used to give thanks to people that contributed to the, to the Brandeis Fund and Brandeis University. So it was it was good. Did I met interesting people there, like a gold in my ear. I remember her, and oh, there were a few others too. Yes. For some reason, he introduced me to Sugar Ray Robinson, (laughs) the fighter. (laughs) And I did, I did Sugar Ray Robinson's apartment. (laughs) Oh, for uh, later on when when I was when you got because when I graduated from Parsons, and that was in interior interior design, yeah, interior design, yeah, interior architecture, but it's interior design. Yeah. And what made you kind of switch to to study that because you were it was part of part of the Parsons one of the options they yeah had. one of the options right and was that that was a good experience it was um, a great experience mm-hmm. uh, it opened up a lot of worlds for me you, you can learn something at school and if it's if it's something that you like and and you're going to go on with it. You you, you learn even more. So mm-hmm. I enjoyed it. Yes. And at, at that point, were you living close to Parsons? 
I left home at the age of 16, wow. which broke my parents' heart. But I, I felt I was grown up, and I got myself an apartment, and that was it. At the age of 16? 16. 16. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, wow, is right. <laughs> I was lucky I made it out of it. I mean, where did you... I lived in the Bronx, wherever I could afford to. But you just felt that you wanted to... I felt like, yeah. You could and live on your own. Yes, and I did. I did. Mm -hmm. I worked in the flower market as Mr. Ming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you graduated from Parsons in interior design. Did you end up working in New York City doing interior design for people? I was working as a designer before I graduated. I made a contact through a friend from my childhood mm -hmm. who was in Hollywood and was doing very well. And he asked me if I wanted to design an entertainment complex. And I said, my God, and of course I said yes. I mean, what? Why not? Mm -hmm. What did I know? <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out very well. Uh, it again, I met some very interesting people, and life marched on. It was good. I was very lucky. Very. Uh, so you had a lot of different projects you could work on, and you mentioned the Sugar Ray Robinson. Yeah. The fighter. The fighter. You designed? I designed his apartment. His I apartment. knew his sister. Uh, his sister's husband worked for me. He had a, a moving company, and I, I was moving a lot of stuff around because I was busy. Mm -hmm. And I got to know her. Very, very nice people. And... That opened up more. Of course, then I met her brother, Sugar Ray. And and how was he? He, he <laughs> was lively, is, I, is what I can say. And he was very nice. Mm -hmm. Very nice man. Mm -hmm. um, and could you mention, would, were there any other projects that come to mind that you really enjoyed yeah, doing? Yeah, yeah. When, when I went to Hollywood, uh, there was a lot of work because there we were, we took over a space that had a lot of beginnings, and they had had endings that weren't that great, and I had a lot of energy, and I was given a lot of leeway. And we put together this entertainment complex in Hollywood. It went very well. We finished it. And I had to come back to New York because everything was going on without me and it needed me. So I did. And uh, it went on and up to a point and then it fizzed out somehow. Something happened to, uh, oh, Leonard Grant, the director of the place. I think he got sick, and he was a driving force in it in Hollywood. So uh, he's passed away in the meantime, but um, little by little, he had to go in different directions, and eventually he sold it. Uh, as I remember, it did very well. And I had no connection with it after that. About a year later, some friends that I had made in Hollywood uh, said they sold it. They sold the entertainment complex. I said, oh. I said, not only did they sell that, but all the property that surrounded it, they sold. And they built uh, skyscrapers there. So that was gone. And how long have you been working as an interior designer? Uh, I'm not quite sure if 
you can say that I worked always as an interior designer because parts of it, if I were doing something, I would get some creative idea and then I had to make it. I had to have someone to make it. So I would then have to find people to work on these projects. And it was a wonderful training ground. And it, it just developed. Mm -hmm. it, it opened up. In the meantime, it's, it's sold, as I said. Uh, any other big projects? Yeah, but, you know, I've been around many, many years. And up to, if eventually I, I will dig it out of my memories, but it's hard to. <laughs> yeah. And I was curious what you thought of the kind of the designs at the time. You know, with some of the changes in the 50s to the 60s and the 70s. It was always, I would present the ideas, but since I was a painter, I would do something called a rendering, which architects did at the time. They mm -hmm. don't do it anymore. They do something on the computer, tick, 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 mm -hmm. and they have an image of what it's going to look like, and they can have all that probably in a day. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to do plans, and the renderings were illustrations of what it was going to look like. I would show, I would do presentation boards where I would have fabrics, paint chips, that kind of thing. And it was a good experience. Mm -hmm. And then at this time, had you, you were working in the city, had you come out onto the North Fork or South Fork at all? Little by little, I, I arrived. <laughs> I first, the first place I went to when I came out here was to Montauk. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. I, it was a world that I never expected to be part of. I made friends with a couple, Wayland was their name, Alberta Wayland was her name, and they had this complex called Hilltop Acres, and they, they were ready to sell it. We made, and, and I found someone that was interested and he want, he wanted to do it but he said he wouldn't do it unless I was with him. Mm. So I said okay and he bought it and I had a half ownership in it and as long as I worked in it. So I put it together and it was really quite handsome except that I got hurt. I caught fire trying to put out a fire in the hotel, mm. and I had to stop for a while. But were you still going back and forth? To in, Manhattan? In, in Manhattan, working? Yes, yeah, yeah. This was more long weekend work. Mm. And that, was this in the 70s or 80s? Yeah, more or less, more or less in the 70s. You've got it down right. <laughs> and it, it, was, it was really, you know, to the... Uh, I had to create, <clears throat> uh, I mean, I, where did it come from? I just did it. Uh, there was a hill. I filled the hill, the, the, the gap in the hill, and we had a large parking sp space, mm -hmm. which s kept solving problems. And <laughs> it was good. Just because I'd never done it before didn't mean I couldn't do it. Yes. <laughs> And I was curious, while you were born and raised in Manhattan and living in there in the 60s and 70s, and did you, obviously it, things were changing. How did you see the environment in Manhattan? Where Did you see some more, because they said there were some problems going on in terms of just economic situations in the city and yes. things getting a little more but I was in I was in the tail end of the change so luckily I didn't have to deal with that okay I did in a way but I I was able to dip into that for a labor force that was good that, 
it's that helped. Yes. And then when did you did Sag Harbor come in later? Oh, Sag Harbor came. I, I tell you that when I first came out here, where did I go? I went to Montauk to fish, right? And of course, I roamed around after that because I wasn't just fishing. I was there for a while. I made friends with the owner of the motel that I was staying at. And uh, I discovered uh, Sag Harbor and East Hampton and various other places around there. And I fell in love with it. Uh, it, it really is. I don't know how much, I don't know today how it stand up to yesterday, but it's... Within how much it has changed. Oh, it, it's, it's been a lot of change. But what happened was I discovered Sag Harbor. I discovered, not Montauk, but I went into Sag Harbor and that's where I met uh, Alberta Wayland and the dentist and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these people, nice people, they're all dead. It's many years ago. <laughs> yes. And did you open up a, an antique business or antique dealer? Were you involved with? Uh... Yes, I, as an antique dealer, it was, it was something I, I just went into. I can't say I had to be in it because of the, of the work I was doing. People were moving out here. And uh, you work someplace, you need something, you find somebody. Mm -hmm. And then you make a friendship. I mean, it just one thing follows another. And of course, there were people that were pretty much in the field I was in. Mm -hmm. And d when did you move fully out onto the south? Oh, well, this is about total move out here yes i would say maybe 20 30 years ago and i was married uh, i was married to a doctor who uh, i had a child by i have a son and who's coming out here my son is living in alaska <laughs> <laughs> and he loves it there yeah. and uh He's coming out now for my birthday, and it's just life. Life develops. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a good life. I have no complaints. Yes. And had you visit visited the North Fork at all at this time, or were you still staying on the South Fork? I was staying on the South Fork, and how did I find the North Fork? Well, I was very interested in boating. And I had in total three or four boats. They kept getting bigger. And I remember that I went out and on the boat and it was very foggy. And I decided to go back home, which was Three Mile Harbor, going into East Hampton, because that's the, to give you an example of how life was then. The first house I bought out here, I paid six thousand dollars for. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I fixed it up and sold wow. it. I, I wish I had it today, but it was good. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a neighbor. There's a lady that was pulling her hair out because she didn't know what I was doing, and she was spying on me all the time, and. I would play tricks on her, which were not bad, but they yeah. were they were comical. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, artificial flowers were coming po into it, very popular. And I was doing a lot of lobbies, designing a lot of lobbies in New York because it was a building boom mm -hmm. in Manhattan. And I would come out here every weekend, out to the other side, mm -hmm. and she really got my goat, and I said, I'm going to have some fun with her. I had bought, because because of the lobbies that I was doing, I would do these arrangements, because I didn't want to change flower arrangements 
all the time. And mm-hmm. They were trying to get away with as little as they, you know, as much as they could. And I brought all these flowers out, plastic flowers, and they were from here to here, from here to where you're standing. It was hard to tell they weren't real. So in the middle of the night, not in the middle of it, but during the day and the middle of the night where I wasn't really, nobody could see me, I planted a paradise of plastic flowers on the lawn next to the house of the lady that was <laughs> looking all the time. And when she woke up in the morning, she could not figure it out. <laughs> 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 but it was good. Yeah. It was good. It was fun. Mm-hmm. And I was curious what you thought of the North Fork, your initial thoughts on what you thought of it compa- in kind of comparison. Oh. How did I discover the North Fork? Well, I would sail around on the boat, go fishing, and we go around Shelter Island. You're going around, and this fog started coming in, and I, I, I didn't pay any attention to it. I just went along figuring I could manage it. It got to the point where I was like, I was in smoke. It was fog. And I didn't know where the hell I was, and I was pretty sure I was on my way through the harbor, going up. And mm-hmm. when the <clears throat> when the when the fog cleared up, I looked around, and I said, "Where the blank am I?" And there I was. Here I was in Greenport. Yeah, pretty much. Oh, in the area, but you you really weren't. No, you didn't I didn't know. know where I was. Yeah. And but I got it. I went to shore, and I docked. There were very few boats in the place I worked, the piers, and I docked there, and I walked around town, and I kept thinking, I like this. It was not the way it is today, but I, it was nice, mm. and. I made friends, and I made sure I came back. And there, there yeah. goes how I discovered this area. And w- kind of when did you decide to make the jump over? It's hard to say when. It was a little uh, bit, yeah. I think it had to do with Bob Burks, that I was working for him in the city, and he was out here. So... He needed something done out here, and I said, I'm going to be out there, and it startled him. And, you know, take it mm-hmm. from there. <laughs> yeah. Because it develops. Mm-hmm. And then you mentioned that you were walking around the area here, and you said it's not the same, it doesn't feel oh, no, the same no, as no. what it is now. It's not. It was more like it was... The two different sides were very much alike. Then little by little, one side started changing. And the area around Sag Harbor became very chic. And the homes became more and more expensive. Mm -hmm. It's it's the same story. Eventually came here. Eventually came here, yes, yes. But it was was very nice here. Mm -hmm. And... How did you decide to open up a gallery in Greenport? It looked... Well, many, many years ago, I was invited to have a show at a library. (laughs) 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 Many years. Uh And that's how it, more or less, that was one of the landing spots for the jumps, Mm -hmm. the library. Mm -hmm. So I'm in a place that I'm very fond of. And when you came up here, did you kind of dedicate more more of your time to your artwork? Yes. Uh, you asked what made me think of opening a gallery. Mm-hmm. Uh, I felt that I could do that here. I felt there was a market for it. And I did. And, and uh, I... 
the the first place that I showed paintings was in was at Hilltop Acres, and then there was a period of not showing and not doing that, where I devoted to something, mm -hmm. a detail of what I was doing, and and uh, but eventually, I felt that that it would be a good place to have one, and. I went at it. <laughs> <laughs> and have you been focusing mostly in painting? Or, or do you do any other type, uh, other mediums? Right painting now? is really the medium. Uh, mm -hmm. I do my own framing. It's, it's quite a production. It, it looks like you see a picture hanging on the wall. It's hard. If you knew what goes into it, <laughs> you'd really appreciate it. But I learned a lot just by doing it. And, of course, I, I was going to Parsons and music and art. And, you know, I had, I had a background in it. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it was good. Mm -hmm. And what type of subject matter do you tend to gravitate towards with your painting? That's an interesting question because I have been focusing on that recently. And I, I have the subject matter, uh, it varied. The medium, it varied. I was interested in watercolor, very, very interested in it. And, and heavily, I worked on it heavily, a lot of watercolor for a while. And then I worked on um, things like collage, assemblage, a lot of that. I'm trying to remember the artist whose work really got me and sent me. If if while I'm talking it, it comes back comes to me, I'm yeah. gonna shout up and stand and <laughs> No but and then what was you wanted to say something about the you mentioned the the meat like kind of what you're working in, but what do you enjoy painting? Wise. Okay, I like, I like the human body. I like the thoughts of painting. I'll, I'll give you an example. I start to paint something. I may not know what I'm, what I'm going to go, where I'm going to go with it. And as I work on it, it talks back to me. The canvas speaks back to me. And if I'm doing if I'm using, here's a very curious thing. If I'm using the, the human body or the face or hands or whatever, the thing that gets me is that it usually, what usually happens is someone that I know, someone from my past, someone that I care for, someone that I've had experiences with, they seem to appear. I have a painting for instance, that I'll never sell. Mm -hmm. It's of my mother at the age of 16. I couldn't possibly have known her. I wasn't born. But I put her together out of old family photos, and she appeared. And a little girl, that she, she appeared as a 16-year-old bride. And... I didn't know that I was doing it until I looked at it and I said, my God, that's my mother. And next to her was this sweet little girl holding her hand and who I saw grow up. That one I knew. And she did not mature into a sweet little girl. She was a bitch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But she was there, yeah. And as she was at the time, mm -hmm. and it's become part of my home. I enjoy living with it, and if sometimes I'm doing a figure, and I look at it, and I know who it is, but I didn't start to do that, or I start to do. I like figurative work. Mm -hmm. I start to do a painting, and it seems like 
it talks back to me. And it, I go in different directions, and then I pull, the, pull, pull it all together as a painting. You know, balance it, arrange. It's, it's a great life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. It's a wonderful thing to be able to do. Uh, and then also with your your work kind of reflecting back on when you started at the music, music and, and art, and art school. school and kind of the work you're doing now. It's very different because mm -hmm. when you start, you're not sure of yourself and you do things that are uncomfortable. When you look at them, you know, as time goes on, and there comes a point where it changes and what I was describing a few seconds ago becomes obvious and you become comfortable with doing that. But before that, you have to make them look like people. You have to dress them. You have to create a composition. It has to be balanced. The texture has to be right. Depending on the medium, you might want to mix it with another medium. Mm -hmm. The medium that I found most interesting was someone that was working like someone that was quite an influence on me. It was someone probably no one remembers anymore. Albert Jackson mm. was a very strong influence on me. And I worked for him. And uh, he was he was very kind, and he was the one that opened up the world of assemblage and collage. So I know I didn't make any sense, but that's more. <laughs> <laughs> and then just and just a little bit more about the the North Fork from when you first moved here, kind of. Look, as you mentioned, there's been changes. Do you miss anything? No. I love the way it is. Uh, my wife Joyce and I came out here. She likes it. Her son has a house up, quite a house, mm -hmm. on the shore. And her children have had children. So I'm grandpa. I love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think they're beginning to I don't know if they're going to be part of the community but they're going their own way and I am I wish I were around for longer but I, you know life is limited mm -hmm. they're going to be they're going to be very involved in this area yes and what Things specifically about the North Fork do you like about living here? It's a clean life, I have to <laughs> tell you. It's a good life. The people that I meet here are very, very nice people. Mm -hmm. I, really good. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it's a very safe area. Uh, I hope it stays that way. And when the gallery that I opened, it's turned into a bed and breakfast. No breakfast, <laughs> just bed. <laughs> and uh, it's a very nice place. Mm -hmm. uh, I've met some wonderful people because of it. And I'm, I continue to do it. I'm very happy doing it. But I also have a studio here. I have the attic, which is very large. And I have a two-car two car <laughs> garage <laughs> that I hang a lot of paintings in and work in when the weather allows me and it's a good place to be <laughs> and because you've you've done a lot of um, uh, interesting and in whether from going to school at the music and art school and, and Parsons and interior design and coming out here and what advice would you give to, to people kind of starting out in that area? And, and I would say live, work, try to work in the community, 
Make sure your environment is a good one. Decide on a path. And don't keep still. Just keep working. Mm -hmm. Because we're all different and we all have something that's good. Mm -hmm. And that we can share and we can develop. It's a good life. But keep living it. <laughs> yes. And then just kind of lastly, do, do you have any other future projects that you're working on? Or if you wanted to discuss some of the other I'm, paintings? Or... I'm working in different mediums. I'm working in watercolor. I'm putting... Uh, I'm, not an, I'm not a fool. I know I'm getting older. And there's just so much I can do. And I'm going to keep doing it. I don't know where it'll end up, but I'm I'm doing well now. I feel very comfortable with what I'm producing. And what am I going to tell you? It just I'm a very lucky man, very. And was there anything else you wanted to say or discuss that we we haven't talked about? I'm I'm uh, on the thirteenth of. This coming month, I'm going to be 93. I have nothing to be sorry about. I'm very happy with my life as I've lived it and as I'm living it. <laughs> I want to have find the strength to keep going. Yes. Also, I, I want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast today and telling your story sharing with us all the wonderful things you're doing and continuing doing. I hope it hasn't been very disorganized. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed it. Yes. I'm enjoying doing it, so... <laughs> oh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Well, I hope you enjoyed episode 48 with Hector de Cordova. I want to thank you for listening to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast, and we'll see you next time.